<laughs> I love you. <laughs> um, hooked. A season of love, sex, and salmon. Hooked follows Joel and Tella through a season chasing salmon through the waters of southeast Alaska. Salmon, carrying the scent of their natal rivers so deep within them, they fin thousands of miles from home before, inexplicably, instinctually, the urge to reproduce compels them home. Home, as if they'd never left. So unlike Tella's migratory childhood, where home was loosely defined, and the only constant was her family's slow disintegration. How did her parents fail in their partnership, and how can she and Joel choose to be different? If salmon are, as artist Ray Troll says, the fish that die for love, what can they teach us? A story of fish and fidelity Hooked asks what it means to be true to a person, to a place, to yourself, and finds surprising answers. Thank you. It's got so much more of the salmon journey in it. That I did not have that blurb before I came up here. So that was born out of this place. And um, and this is this place do that yeah. yeah, it did. It worked. <laughs> yeah, magic. Yeah. Uh, the bit that I'm going to read you guys is from chapter one, just the first uh, opening scene there. So this is uh, northbound. Salmon are born orphans, destined to swim in their parents' wake. Incubated by rivers, they hatch as untended nestlings whose guardians are gravel and debris, deep pockets and bright water. They abandon the nest as teenagers, riding the ripples downstream, compelled to seek a world unknown, a something else they can't name or see, neither can they, de neither can they defy the call to go. Theirs is not an aimless drift. They swim with certainty. Their route is preordained, a journey that will see them thousands of miles away, the same far-flung waters that their parents travel. Their parents are ghosts at their fins, always guiding their path. Some will travel a year, some up to five, before a different compulsion drives them back to their birth stream. There they dig their own riverbed nest, lay and fertilize their own eggs, and there they die, discarded bodies left to nourish the same ecosystem grown of their ancestors. Pre-birth, a salmon story is already written. I am not an orphan. Neither is my partner, Joel. Yet we both reenact an annual migration none of our parents still make. Now he shoves the last backpack into his parents' Prius, where Don and Mary Jean await us. Well, buddy? He turns to me with an expectant smile. You ready to go? Ready to get back to the boat and get to work? Usually, this isn't even a question. Fifteen years ago, my high school best friend observed that every spring she could see the ocean in my eyes, pulling me back, washing me away, a wild force with which no human could compete. My story, like the salmon's, precludes conscious examination. Yet this June I pause to consider Joel's question. Am I ready to trade this two-story house, firmly rooted among cedar and fir, for months aboard a 43-foot fishing boat? inescapably enmeshed with the capricious mood swings of ocean, salmon, ship, and sweetheart. <laughs> Joel and I have spent just four nights within these walls, a first home for us both. We've snuggled on the red secondhand couch planted in an otherwise empty living room, drinking our surroundings in with the terror-tinged awe of people who have just thrown themselves at a 30-year debt 
a financial commitment that looms longer than Joel has been alive. Meanwhile, our boat, the Nurka, has spent the past eight months alone, ever since we buttoned her up and skipped town at the end of the previous salmon season. She, like all boats, is sensitive, easily offended by perceived slights. Who knows what punishment awaits us? Am I ready? I've spent my life orbiting between Washington Earth, Alaskan Sea, and back again, and have yet to find an easy formula for these seasonal migrations. Spoken in my tongue, home is a four-letter word. Who knew that such a humble gathering of letters could demand so much space, crowding a mouth with doubt and self-conscious longing? Though I haven't maintained full-time residence in the 49th state since childhood, I feel more comfortable in my skin there than anywhere else. But sentimentality falls short in a state where even 20-year transplants are dismissed as newcomers, where migratory species like me are invasive, seasonal obstacles. Even one of my closest friends, a Seattleite himself, delights in pointing out that I'm not a real Alaskan anymore. You went to school in Washington, you vote in Washington, you bought a house in Washington, you're a Washingtonian. A lawyer by trade, facts speak loudest to Andrew. Me, though, I am Libra born and social work trained. Facts have always comprised one detail, rather than the whole picture. I can't deny my friend's argument. Most of Joel's and my family live hours of our new house, and we've cultivated valuable friendships down south. Down south, a life spent in limbo creates its own geography. Only one latitude in a line bisects my world, the 55th parallel north, creating binary points of reference. Down south, anywhere below the Alaskan-Canadian border, and up north, everything above. But if this is, as Andrew says, the place to which I now belong, why do I feel such relief to leave? And is it the relief, is the relief about the leaving or the going back to? What is it that I return to with such hunger? This morning, I don't need to know the answers to all of these questions. There's only one that matters. I'm ready. Firmly pulling the front door closed, I turn the key in the lock and follow Joel to the waiting car with a lighter step. I am leaving my house, returning to my home. Mm -hmm. And thank you guys for being here today. I, I really appreciate